Uh, why don't we go ahead and jump right into it? We're sitting in today with Greg Cunningham, head of global diversity, equity, and inclusion at U.S. Bank, the number of five, the fifth largest bank in the country. Great. So high energy, had me engaged the entire time. I think what's great about Kevin's message is that, you know, no matter how naturally talented you are, no matter how great you can be, you can always keep striving for that next level. And even, you know, if you become complacent, you might not even realize you've done it. But Kevin really helps you realize, you know, that there's so much more that you can do. If you take a step back, really reevaluate what you're doing and what you're not doing, you can take it to the next level. I loved his message about God's gift to you and your gift back, and he's just so down to earth and just a helpful, wonderful man. You know, really, I think you can put him in front of anybody, and you're, you're going to be inspired, you're going to be motivated, you're going to want to go out there, and you're going to want to start, you know, reaching for that next level today. Hey, thanks so much for joining in to the Leadership is Personal podcast, bringing you real-world solutions to real-world challenges in anywhere from three to ten-minute increments. Leadership is personal. Here's the better results. Greg, how's it going? I'm good, Kevin. I'm honored to be here, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, man, it is a blessing and an honor for me to be able to interview you. Um, And knowing that you are a storyteller, maybe I've stolen your thunder, but knowing that you're a storyteller, I'm kind of looking forward to this. Why don't you uh, do me a favor, man, tell me a little bit about about Greg Cunningham and uh, your role over at U.S. Bank. Yeah, you know, it's it's been a blast, man. You know, I've been I've been at the bank for you know a, a little over three years now, and uh, it's gone well. It's going well, as you know, and you stated. I've you know spent most of my career um, as a marketing guy and really trying to bring life to brands and bring brands to life, and that's what I do, man. And uh, it's been uh, an awesome ride at the bank. I started a marketing role. Um, really, you know, standing up campaigns and driving initiatives against uh, new and emerging segments um, for financial services and did some great work there. And then this opportunity came to really leverage something that was really personally um, a passion of mine, man. And, and, you know, this whole notion of inclusion and everything I've done in my career, Kevin, has always been about, you know, sort of this intersection of, of, you know, driving business growth and and having a deep care for my community and advancing issues that are important to my community. So um, this role has really allowed me to do it, man. And, and, you know, the work of inclusion is, you know, more important now than it ever has been. And I think um, it requires people who bring a different skill set um, and new skill sets to the space. So it's been, it's been a fun ride, man. I'm enjoying every day of it. That's absolutely awesome. Tell me something, Greg, because, you know, those people that do know Greg and Greg and I go back a little ways from, my days of working at Target. Of course, I've worked at U.S. Bank in the past. Unfortunately, I didn't get the opportunity to work with Greg, but um, we were both there. Greg, tell me something. This whole DNI space, and, and just to be clear, I might refer to it as D-I-N-O because I've added a bit to the lexicon. I call it diversity, inclusion, and outcomes. Um, you'll sure. hear people refer to it as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I like to add the, the, um, the outcomes or the O because, frankly, I think oftentimes people forget that piece. But Tell me something. Tell me how your experience and your expertise at being a storyteller has benefited the the role and the narrative around diversity and equity and inclusion at the bank. Look, man, the, the most important thing in this work is really about making a human connection. And diversity is all about you know, it's all about making space for people who are different than you. And it's working across those differences. It's not about, you know, ignoring, embracing. It's acknowledging that there are so many dimensions of difference and the leaders that are most effective um, in any organization are able to bring together um, groups of people with different backgrounds, different experiences, and get them to work across that difference towards a common goal. And so, you know, my ability to come in and share stories and share my experiences, both my triumphs and my stumbles, um, I think has allowed me to build trust. And I think people, you know, people are looking for um, connections. They're looking for, um, you know, because I, I think most people in organizations really do want to embrace this notion of, um, you know, bringing my full self to work, work, bring, 
creating space for others to do the same thing. Most people fundamentally don't disagree with that. I think the challenge is, is most people have a lot of anxiety and fear around, you know, does this mean, you know, women and African-American and Hispanics are going to, you know, get jobs that I now won't get. And so you have to disarm, you know, people in a way that um, helps them understand that this work is never about favor. Um, it's always about parity. And it's about, you know, making those connections and sharing experiences that are very human. Um, Because that's how people learn most effectively. Most people learn through experience. And Mm -hmm. when people share a common experience, um, it allows you to collaborate more effectively, allows you to have, you know, honorable disagreement. It allows you to have discussion and discourse and arrive at a collective point of view that allows you to move forward um, despite all the, the things that may on the surface, um, separate you or create space between you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Has, it, has it been what you expected or, you know, has it been one of those times or a few of those times? No. Know, wow. Not what I expected. No, nothing about it is what I expected. You know, it, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder than I thought it was. Again, I, I didn't have, you know, any experience in the world of, of human resources or, um, or as a diversity and inclusion practitioner, um, and I'm not sure I even um, to this day would consider myself either. Um, but I think it, it's been a lot harder um, in the sense that we're talking about an organization of 74,000 people. And the real change you're trying to make is about cultural change. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so much of the focus in, in this work and particularly our industry, because we're so metrics driven, mm-hmm. is about you know, the numbers and are the scorecards and the dashboards moving and, and all of that is critically important. Um, but what's far more important is the change in behavior, um, the shift in culture, and all of that has to happen before the numbers will ever change. Mm-hmm. And I think the most sobering thing for me, honestly, Kev, has been, you know, the fact that you wake up one day and realize how many of us and and many people who are committed their careers and committed their lives to making change and and social change is you realize you may not actually see the end result of the uh, the fruits of your labor. Like Mm -hmm. you may never actually see the finish line. Um, And that's a pretty sobering fact, you know, that a lot of us come to realize. And that's been the hardest part for me, particularly as a, uh, as a marketer and, you know, somebody who's used to, developing a series of strategies and tactics and and you know there's a start and an end date to it and then you you can you know summarize and analyze the results and make tweaks and adjustments and and go forward and do it again with with all of those um adjustments but this isn't that kind of work and you know it it's a pretty sobering thing to know that that the the work that you're doing may not you know, it might be generations down the line that really benefit from the work that you're doing. And that's, that's a hard realization to, to come to terms with. So, you know, it, it's interesting because that's, that's the one part, you know, Greg, I think we've had enough conversations and, you know, I've run like, I've run away from diversity inclusion, like it was a plague <laughs> for mm-hmm. much of my career. Um, yeah. You know, for that same reason of being pigeonholed or the, the, the idea that it, that, it takes so long, right? And that the metrics aren't there. And so it, it really, that that's one thing that kind of drives me nuts, right? Because business really moves, certainly in the financial services industry, it moves on quarterly cycles and annual cycles, right? You know, when you talk about revenues or you might talk about losses or you might talk about risk, but it's, it's always what's happening to uh, <coughs> shareholder value and mm-hmm. earnings calls and, you know, sort of annual numbers. And what what makes it so hard to be able to sort of quantify what you're doing around changing the culture and its impact on, say, productivity or or whatever you know KPIs that you might look at. What what makes it what makes it in your mind? What makes it so hard to move from that kind of quarterly cycle, annual cycle, to a more generational cycle? What what causes that? Well, I'll answer by saying this. I, I, it, it's not that hard to quantify. I mean, there, there are, you know, certainly metrics and tools that, um, that allow you to sort of measure progress. The, the impact, though, 
um, is is much greater than the annual or, or quarterly talent movement of people between levels. How many hires did we make in this quarter? How many people left? Um, you know, that that part of it is easy. The more yeah. difficult part is the behavioral change that you need leaders to actually do something different. Mm-hmm. You need leaders to understand that, you know, as leaders, we're hardwired to we're hardwired to always have the answers. <laughs> like that's just how we're that's just how we're made. And it's a more difficult challenge to get people who are used to leading and and to to show up as the student and not the teacher. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so corporations are just and businesses are simply a microcosm of larger society. And so to think that these organizations and change is going to happen more rapidly than the societal change, which is driving the behaviors that happen inside corporations, is flawed, you know, by nature. So, you know, it's not to say that we should just throw our hands up and and give up, but there are a few things that you can do to lay the groundwork and begin to shape behavior and shape leadership behavior so that you can at least, you know, feel that you're making a difference within this world, your four walls of your organization. And there are companies who are doing that work really, really well. And, you know, there are some of us who are still on that journey and, you know, still, you know, trying to make um, slow progress, but you can't ignore the impact that larger society and the issues and, um, you know, social ills that are, that happen and the disparities mm-hmm. that happen in our communities. Um, mm-hmm. aren't going to also show up inside our companies as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally get that. Especially, you know, we're living through some very interesting times. It's, uh, you know, dare I say it may be even bifurcated um, where you got, you know, kind of two sides of the coin, if you will. And so without going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I yeah. But you know, what's interesting about that is I just had that conversation with somebody the other day and and they were saying something about, you know, what happened in November of 2016 and, you know, that caused a different discourse with outside corporations and, and yeah, that's true. But I think what's important about that is, you know, it, it's a 50, 50 world out here, you know, mm-hmm. as, mm-hmm. as many people as were upset by, you know, the results of any election and that one in particular, there were just as many people who were thrilled Absolutely. And, and we are living and working in a world that is, you know, that is truly 50-50. And so our jobs as leaders is to understand and appreciate that and, you know, be able to push past these maybe fundamental societal um, social, you know, differences that we might have and focus on these business outcomes, like you said. Yeah. You know, that is a skill and that's the art and that's the, you know, that's the work that we're doing is how do you arm leaders with those tools to, um, to perform in that way. I think the tough part about that, um, Greg, is quite simply, that's just not how our brain works, right? We know that our right. brain sift out and filter information and find that information that already supports our current ideology. So, you know, you really have to sort of, sort of change the way people are thinking, you know, and the way their brain is working in order to kind of really see that, that particular change. What, what feedback might, might you give someone that's thinking about, you know, kind of jumping into the space? Um, what, what would you tell them? I would tell them, you know, just what I told you before. I mean, I, I think it, as long as you realize, you know, first of all, put your battle armor on and, you know, be ready to be ready to go to be ready to go to war. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just know that, you know, this is the work. If you're, if you're a person who really needs to see, you know, instant outcomes, you know, and have that, that immediacy of, you know, results and, you know, and get that gratification in that way, this is not the work for you because it just doesn't happen that fast. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been my experience. You know, the, the, the numbers don't move that fast. You know, cultural change is a much, um, much more difficult, much more artful. Um, it's much more art than science. And if that's not your makeup, then this is not the work for you because it doesn't, um, it doesn't move that fast. And you've got to be a person who is brave um, and, and fearless. And 
um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who do this work, who, you know, who aren't willing to be vulnerable themselves. And mm -hmm. you've got to be a bit of a storyteller. You've got to be somebody who leads out loud, um, somebody who's willing to share your, you know, your warts and your superpowers. Um, because people, you know, people don't trust institutions. Mm -hmm. Nobody trusts institutions. People That's trust right. other people. That's right. And if you, if you do this work, people need to trust you and they need to know your story. Um, and they got to, you know, find some um, comfort in your story and find some humanity in your own story that mm -hmm. allows them to feel comfortable sharing theirs. Yeah. You know, I, what else I find quite interesting is, you know, we're, we're not one big monolith as we talk about, you know, let's say African-American specifically, because that's the, that's the one group that I probably know the most about. Um, I, I find it kind of interesting because you talked about, you know, this whole, all of this work is really about giving people the space for, um, you know, bringing their difference, if you will. And quite often that difference is assessed initially based on what people see. And, yeah. you know, some of the conversations that I have with some of the groups that I talk with or consult with and work with is, you know, um, as a as a people, as a culture, some of the things that we have to get through and get past in order to really be able to bring our full selves to work is even being comfortable in our own skin. And so mm -hmm. I often say your ability to drive diversity and inclusion and outcome is highly positively correlated to how comfortable you are in your own skin. And so, mm -hmm. you know, talk to me a little bit. Give me your perspective a little bit. I, I talk to a number of people in this space as well, Greg. And quite honestly, if I'm being transparent, many of them are not as authentic as you. Um, some yeah, would even true. tell you, would go so far as to say, um, you know, they want to appear authentic, but they can't be authentic. You know, I, I personally call bullshit on that. Um, right. I think in those instances, you do a disservice to the work that's being done when you're being inauthentic. And that really is, that really does fall down in my mind into that, how comfortable you are in your own skin and how willing you will you be vulnerable? And so talk to me a little bit about maybe some of the experiences that you've had where you've maybe worked with some people who, who are under the guise of doing the best they can and thinking they're doing the right thing, maybe doing something um, that's counterproductive to the, to the work that you're doing. Talk to me a little bit about that. Have, have you had that experience? What's, what's that uh, been like if you've had that experience? I, th I think most people I won't say most people. I think a lot of people are scared. And I, I have never been that. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've, I experienced a pivot in my career probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago when I realized the, the only way for me to be successful and be proud of the work I was doing and be proud of myself and live up to um, the best of um, my ancestors' dreams, if you will, was to be myself and to, to be um, as brave and courageous as I possibly could inside um, mm -hmm. those, those four walls. And that probably meant that I was going to sacrifice some vertical movement in mm -hmm. my career mm -hmm. because that was never because that was never that important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that, you know, the money and the financial rewards aren't important. They absolutely are. But I realized that all I was really chasing um, was truth and honesty, um, mm -hmm. both with myself and in the work that I was doing. And I had a moment where our chief marketing officer used to have an 8 o'clock a.m. meeting every Monday morning. And I was on the senior staff of the marketing team at the time. And you know these meetings very well, Kev, where, you know, at the end of the meeting, the leader sort of goes around the room and everybody sort of gives a, you know, a 30 second update of what they're working on and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And I remember every Sunday night, I would have like the Sunday night dreads, you know, just thinking about what I was going to say on Monday morning at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then I would leave the meeting and, you know, always feel like, man, I wish I had said that differently or man, that sounded stupid. And I would beat myself up about, you know, what I was saying. And until finally one day, you know, I just said, you know, I just need to be me. And, <laughs> you know, it came my turn to give the update. And I said, you know, I took my kids to see Akilah and the Bee this weekend. And what was so cool about that was, you know, the, the Starbucks 
um, corporation actually underwrote and helped produce that film. And the reason that's important is because they started to think differently about the business that they're in, that they're not in the coffee business, they're, they're in the experience business. And, you know, I guess it begs the question, what business do we think we're in? And it really sparked this whole conversation in the staff meeting. And I, my CE, CMO looked at me, you know, in a way that I'd never seen him look at me before, you know, mm-hmm. where I could tell he, you know, for the first time, like actually really saw me. He saw right? you. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, I realized in that moment that I got to do me. I got to yeah. do me. I can't yeah. try to talk like, you know, you know, Joey who went to Harvard or so-and-so yeah. who went to Penn or you know, and, and I need to just do me and whatever that means in terms of my ability to ascend in the organization, yeah. it'll be what it's going to be, but I'm going to do me and, you know, it'll either work or it won't. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see that a lot though. I don't, you don't see enough of that in corporate America. That, I think there lies our problem, Greg. I, I think that's a big part of our problem, right? We're so busy trying to assimilate, right? And, and, and yes. this, this is all sort of come full circle for me, right? Because well, first off, I recognize this is not work of security, right? Because your job right. is to really make people uncomfortable, right? And right. somehow, you know, right. much like an organ that's been transplanted, sometimes the body rejects you, right? And yes. so I, I recognize that. But, you know, it's come a little full circle. And um, I, I kind of liken it to what my mother used to tell me when I was a kid. And I think you know me well enough to know that I'm always going to be me. And, and frankly, yes. if I'm being totally transparent, I don't give a damn if you don't like it or not. I'm just going to be me. And my mother That's used right. to always tell me, boy, your mouth's going to be the death of you. And, and someone said to me one day, and one day recently, you know, I said to them, you know, my mom always said, boy, your mouth is going to be the death of you. And they looked at me and they said, for the life of many. Yeah. That's all. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yes. Because, you know, I, I mean, you really are providing a, a voice for the for the voices. Some of the work that I'm working on right now, Greg, um, and I'm just calling it internal locus leadership. I haven't figured out some funky brandable name for it, but really what it's about, you know, it's, it's very similar to what you just said. I, I, I tell folks to think about that time when they didn't have time to sort of plan out their action or what they were going to do. They were basically leading based on their instincts and just who they are at their very core. And I think that's where people are best in leadership. When they're leading from a place that, look, this is just who I am. This is how I see the world and how we need to, how we need to move based on my instinct. And I personally think that that's the best type of leadership, man. When you think about people, you know, like the Greg Cunninghams or, you know, the Anton Vincent or, you know, if you want to add some more <coughs> jobs of the world. And I'm not saying I'm a huge Steve Jobs fan, but. The one thing I will say is when you talk about those people I just named, those people are authentic. They are who they are. And the organizations that they're part of and that they move, that's exactly what those organizations need at that time. And so I think you will hit the nail square on the head when you said, look, man, I just got to be me. Yeah. Right. I, I think leaders really do, really do need to do that more. And I think oftentimes as people of color, we get in our own heads and in our own way you know, trying to be someone that we think other people want us to be, as opposed to simply being just who you are. Well, you know? it's because, you know, it, it is partly assimilation, as you said. And, and um, first of all, I appreciate you mentioning me in the same sentence as, as Steve Jobs and Anton Benson. Um, but I, you know, I think we seek validation from um, other people. And, you know, when you join these corporations, you know, you, you seek validation from your boss, you seek validation from your community. And because you're, you're, you've allowed your self-worth and your value to be attached to um, how other people think of you. And I've never subscribed to that. Like I just never, you know, needed that. And it's, you know, like who, who's, you know, it's like, who do you, who do you want to be? Martin Luther King or Ken Chenault? You know, they're both incredible and in, in, in historical figures in our culture and our history. And they were both incredibly great men. And yeah. who's to say one's value, you know, where Steve, you know, um, uh, Ken Chenault is a multi multi millionaire, but he was no richer than, than Martin. Um, and so. Well, that's a question I, of how you define rich, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> right. Right. That's how, how do you define rich? It, it's, it's how, and, that, and that's an individual, and that's an individual thing, right? Yeah. That's for all of us to define that for ourselves. 
um, because in my mind, you know, there was no greater and richer man than Dr. Martin Luther King, you know? And, but someone else might say, I want to be Ken Chanel because I need to have the boat and I need to have the title and I need to have the, all the money in the world and I need to do all that. And I don't give a damn about, you know, all this other stuff. And so yeah. not that Ken Chanel doesn't, I'm not suggesting that, but you know, anyway, I, I think a lot of it is about, you have to, it is what you say to yourself about yourself and you've got to know your worth and you've got to have, you know, a sense of value. And to me, you know, the way I, I love, and, and a couple of my friends and I have talked about this what you have to have now is you have to have audacity. It's like my favorite freaking word now in corporate America because it's like you, you have to have the audacity to say what needs to be said, to do what needs to be done, and, and just go for it, right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, there, is no, there, there, there are no more times for playing it safe. You know, there's too much at stake, and we have too much um, to offer and our kids are too brilliant, and the next generation won't stand for it. Um, so true. Um, so I'm excited about it, man. I, I think you're touching on some really important stuff. And you know, for me, it's you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do GC always, and it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be what it's gonna be. <laughs> well, you know, man, that's one of the that's one of the reasons why I was psyched as hell to have you on, Greg. You know, I mean, if if I'm thinking about my my past corporate history and that sort of thing. The times when I've had the greatest amount of success were those times when, frankly, I put the most on the line and knew that it wasn't going to be a situation where someone was going to validate what I was thinking. In fact, it was counter to what, what right. someone else would, would tell me to do, right? But it was, you know, there are those times when, you know, it's just at your core, it, it, it sort of touches something and you've got to address it, you know, you, yeah. you got you to gotta go after it. And so that's really what, you know, that's really what I hope this next generation, the people that that listen to the podcast understand that, you know, like Greg said, you know, you just got to do you. Yeah, and really, that's what people want. And right? just go. And just go. Yeah. And don't think about it. Just go. Because, you know, if, if it ain't the environment for you, if, if you can't show up and be who you are and do what you do, then you're in the wrong environment, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's time to go do something else, you know? Yeah. And, and it's real simple, too, right? I mean, I remember my first day at, uh, I remember my first day at, at, at U.S. Bank and one of the guys that worked with me said, hey, man, you got to, you know, my wife made some pumpkin pie. You got to come have some of this pumpkin pie. And I oh thought, God, good. I'm good on this. <laughs> I know. Let me know when you brought this, bring the sweet potato pie. I'm going to bring you some sweet potato pie. Unless you are going to let's see where it lands. I said, let me, okay, I'm going to try some pumpkin pie. And he kind of looked at me and said, You've never had pumpkin pie? I said, man, don't throw you no pumpkin pie. pie. (laughs) But the beauty is there are some that do. There's probably some some correlation between, you know, those that do and and growing up in Minnesota. Probably (laughs) along some economic strata or something. I'm sure there's some correlation there somewhere. You you know, you're probably right. But, you know, that's that's the beauty of of the difference of people, right? You know, people talk about, I I like, I, I love the music analogy. People say, you know, um, you know, you want to be invited to the party and then you want to be invited to dance, right? Because being invited to the party is diversity and, and being invited to dance is sort of that inclusion piece. But I often say that if you've invited me to the party and I don't one time in that party go, damn, that's my song, then yeah. I'm not included, right? My music's got to be on the playlist. And so Absolutely. that's another thing I'll leave for the folks here, right? Absolutely. You know? Listen, oh. a, good club anal- a good club analogy is always appropriate. Oh, I, <laughs> that's right. That's right. You it's know. just like a big club. The corporation is just like a big club, man. No doubt. No doubt. We, you know, it, we'll just leave it. No at, you know, we'll leave it right there. Well, you know, you know, Greg, I, I, I am thoroughly enjoying you know the podcast, and that's why I like to do the podcast like this. You know, I've heard, you know, ah, I don't know, are you guys in the same room? Or you know, the people that I interview happen to be all over the world. I mean, Greg, you, you happen, we happen to both be sitting in Minneapolis right about now, but. You know, I love just kicking it, right? My podcast yeah. is just a conversation. There's no pretense. You know, Greg did not know what the hell I was going to ask him. At all. No clue. <laughs> Had no clue. And I'd rather be that, right? Now. Yeah, because you can just be you. Yes. You know, you just sort of sort of go after it. And that's, that's one of the benefits, I think, that, that um, U.S. Bank has by having someone like you in that particular role. You know, I, I would... I would love to see, you know, our corporations move beyond just looking at who's being hired and who's being retained and getting mm-hmm. into situations where 
you know, cause where I really think the, the benefit of diversity and inclusion and outcomes happens is really around, you know, the innovation that happens and how decisions are being made and having people sitting at the table, you know, so you don't have situations like the ancestry.com, you know, yeah. situation that just happened recently. Yes. And I, you know, and that doesn't necessarily happen just by virtue of having someone different at the table, because as we just talked about, they could be different or they might look different but not necessarily be different. And I think that right. uh, corporations have to do, a, I'll say it, a better job of making certain that as they look to hire different, that they're actually getting difference beyond just, you know, the exterior, if you will. You know, because yeah. a guy yeah. who, you know, guy from, a guy from Wyzetta or a guy from, you know, the Upper East Side of New York is going to be very different than a guy from, you know, the inner city of Detroit or, you know, oh, Philadelphia no. or, or, or Pittsburgh, you no might doubt. know about that. No doubt, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt, no doubt. But I'm excited about it, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Again, as I said, I'm honored to be on, man. I appreciate um, you asking me to to spend this time with you. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and and I will say that you know we got some stuff for him, man. We we you know U.S. Bank, we got some. I'm not trying to hype U.S. Bank too much, but it like we actually got some stuff coming, man. With this whole you know, because it's about creating economic opportunity. And changing people's lives, man. That's at the end of the day, whether you're talking about hiring somebody as an employee, how you treat somebody as a customer, how you invest in these communities, and not just always from a charitable perspective, but I mean truly yeah. investing in these communities, man. That's we we we're about to do some really exciting stuff, man. And I'm I'm really thrilled and excited about the stuff that's coming up. Well, that that's awesome, Greg. You know, I would love to have you back once it once it hits the market, maybe come back and let us know how it's gone, how how it went you know, what the learnings were. And uh, again, love to have you back. Totally appreciate you being here and sharing the, uh, sharing the insights. And hopefully the, um, hopefully the people that, that join in and listen to, the, listen to the podcast enjoy it as much as I did. No doubt, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. If you join us here each and every week, you'll get a tidbit of information and insight that'll help you be the best version of yourself. Come back next week. Be sure to join us on Facebook, within the Facebook group. Check us out on Twitter and on Instagram. Kevin D. Wright. Look us up. Check us out. Link to us online. Love to hear from you. Unlike some of the other podcasts, I want to hear directly from you, and I will answer your question. There's no question too tough, so together we can solve it. Stop back and tell a friend. Leadership is personal. Here's the better results.